sailboats and steamboats and rowboats and jet boats trading and warring and fighting and hiding the river is stronger you cannot get beyond her rolling down the river water it has the power to nurture it has the power to give pleasure and the power to fear and whenever humans settle near water it is a partner in their evolution in their growth in their industry their capital and in the rise and fall of their economies the waterfront in niagara was all of that it was a gateway to european settlement after being inhabited by the first nations for thousands of years it divided three nations during the war of 1812 and it became the hub of industry commerce and employment where great fortunes were made and lost in the early 19th century the dock area was known for its mosquito filled marshes yearly flooding and uninhabitable land in the 1830s niagara harbor and dock company transformed all that by dredging the swamps to create a harbor and the marina we know today they would become the largest shipbuilding facility in upper canada and great ships were designed built and launched right here from 1833 to 1850 they built over 15 steam vessels 20 schooners 18 barges and at least 3 naval vessels in a very short time they created an industrial boom Soon the dock area would have two hotels, a lumber mill, an axe factory, a soda pop factory, a soap and candle factory, a barrel making factory, a basket factory which burned down, a railroad car factory, a lime kiln brickyard, and an apple evaporator. A fishing industry became a flourishing commercial enterprise. It began with local fishermen and a lake rich with sturgeon, pike, white fish and eels but uh, back in those early days it was all everybody moved either by sail or by rowing <clears throat> and so that's why i say it was uh, a pastoral waterfront it was dominated by the commercial fishermen uh, interestingly all along the shore right from the wharf right out to the 6 mile creek there were the uh, shoreline was broken up into what they referred to as allotments and uh any particular fisherman was this was his allotment and then the next one and the next one and the next one all the way out to the 6 mile creek and so that's where all the activity was for example uh from the from king street to ball street was an allotment allocated to tom elliot of the elliot house known as the whale inn at the foot of king street and he owned the rights to this property so on this property you would have found and all along the shoreline you would have found the net winders and those sorts of things down river the small boat flat bottom boat would row out from shore and as it rowed out it would um, let the net go over the side and it didn't go out very far the boat and it rowed the crew rowed up river and then when they got up river maybe 100 yards they would pull the net back into shore and so they would be scooping all the fish between the shoreline and the water's edge and uh they would catch so many fish in that short area that at the up river end they had another rope and that rope would be attached to a horse or maybe even a windlass on shore or a windlass that was turned by a horse because that's the only way they get get the net in because it would be so loaded with fish one day they had a particularly a very good catch and they caught over 6000 white fish and they were all piled up on the beach at the foot of King Street where they were be put into barrels and people from town would come down and they'd buy a barrel for the winter uh at $6 for a barrel the key and this is when things changed drastically down here is when the railroad came in in 1854 and so the scene goes from a very pastoral scene to a very industrious scene <clears throat> and uh, it actually literally explodes what happened down here 
Railroad Baron Samuel Zimmerman built his railroads to meet at the water's edge. But when he was killed in an accident in one of his own trains, his empire died with him. It was left to other entrepreneurs to expand the rail network in Niagara. Bankruptcies and bad debts plagued the dock area. But shipping and railroads cost money, but also made some people a great deal of money. Railroads transported people, military troops and produce, and at the docks they were met by the great steamships. And tourism was now the growing economic base for the town. In the 1870s, the Niagara Navigation Company had introduced a fleet of legendary steamboats, the Chippewa, the Corona, the Shikora, and the most famous of them all, the Cayuga. For half a century, the Cayuga made her legendary voyages between Toronto and Niagara. Her luxury decks of mahogany and soft palm leaves were infamous for night-long dances and romances. From her maiden voyage in 1906 to her last crossing in 1957, she carried more than 15 million passengers and countless tons of Niagara fruit and vegetables, vehicles and cargo. It all made very good business sense until it stopped. The decline of tourism, the advent of the automobile and a world war all added to a massive economic slump in Niagara and the dock area once again became known for its swampy waters, derelict sinking wooden boats and faded hotels. But great sailors are renowned in this town and in 1947 Shepherd Boatworks was built it was the beginning of another era of worldwide recognition for brilliance in boat building. The award-winning C&C yachts operated their factory here for 30 years. They were Canada's largest builders of sailboats before being destroyed by fire in 1994. Today, the dock area is home of the venerable Niagara Sailing Club. Paddleboards, and kayaks and jet boats all contribute to the character of a waterfront that has made Niagara on the lake the place it is today. From the noise and grunge of an industrial heartland to the fashionable quiet of sailing boats and condominiums. And yes, it still is a place of controversy and passion. Rolling down the river Rolling down the river this is your story, this is the life The river has won you fair in the fight This is her rage, her calm, her story Her songs, her power, her beauty